Shape up your website. Welcome to day four, plan your website redesign. My name is Lorraine Ball and I am your website fitness coach. We've put together a five day workout plan that you can use to improve your website. The session today is part of that five day program. And while they fit together as a nice neat bundle, you can actually just watch any of the sessions as single self-contained units. But today we're going to be focusing on building that plan, getting ready to talk to a web design company or to take on the project yourself. The first thing that you need to do whenever you're taking the first steps in an endeavor like this is to ask yourself, why are you doing it now and what objectives and outcomes are you looking for? Why now? What's your reason? Is it to update your image or simply replace an out of date and aging website? Improve lead generation or your, your SEO on your site? Add new functions? We talk to clients all the time who have a perfectly acceptable website, but what they want to do is make it easier to update and add new information because that new information is what helps them stay current on search rankings. Maybe you've got new products or services. Maybe you're taking your company in a totally different direction or launching a new business. Whatever your reason for changing, there should always be a metric that you can use to say, yes, the project was successful. Maybe it's more traffic, maybe it's more conversions, maybe it's more people filling out a form or longer time on site. Whatever your objective is, that should be defined up front. And the other thing is, when do you want to launch? Be realistic. A good web design project where you're really paying attention to all the details and doing it right is going to be three to five months, depending on the complexity of your site. In a world of business owners who want to get it done now, get it done now, I know that's frustrating, but that's how long it takes. So before you start, there are things that you can do to get organized, to get your ducks in a row, so that when you start the process, it moves smoothly. Basics. Do you own your domain name and do you know when it renews? Do you have the credentials for your hosting and will your current hosting package be sufficient for the new site? If you have trusted your previous hosting company with this information, it could be a problem because if you decide to change hosts, they may or may not be really happy. But you should own this information. And even if you aren't going to redo your website for two, three, or four years, God forbid, you need to get this information. These bills, these renewal notices need to be coming to you. You need to have a Google account set up and evaluating the traffic to your website and helping you research your keywords. And if you have an existing website, you need the login credentials for updating that site, and you need to conduct a content audit. What's on the website now? What will you keep? What do you need to replace? Don't wait until you're three weeks into the web design to start figuring out that you need new photographs or new video or you need to write new information. All of this you can do before you start building. Collect your assets and inventory what you've got. First and foremost, do you have a transparent version of your logo and a single color version? What do I mean by that? Do you see how this round peg seems to just float on the page and you can nicely see the background, not only above and below, but peeking through the letters? That's because this logo has a transparent background. It's probably a PNG or a GIF. 
This version of my logo is a JPEG. It has a white background. That's the thing about JPEGs. They always put some kind of colored background. And the problem is even when you try to match the color exactly, exactly, it's going to look a little different than your background, and it always sort of looks a little bit pasted on. So go back to whoever designed your logo and make sure you have a transparent version. Now, the reason I put the white logo here was because this blue is actually so closely matched to this background that when I put a transparent logo here, all you see is the peg. Having a transparent logo gives you options. You can do more with the logo. You want to have brand standards. You want to define what colors you use. You notice that I said a minute ago that the blues were so close that it disappeared. That's because this background and the blue in my logo are exactly the same color. Hexadecimal, 02, A1, A7. That is so important because then everywhere I go, on social media, in my email, on my website, round peg blue looks like round peg blue looks like round peg blue. You also want to figure out what photos and videos you have. Do you need new pictures of your team? Do you have the rights to stock photography that you can use? And take a good look at those stock photographs. Do you want to use them? Do they still look good or are they looking a little dated? And don't stop at just the pictures and the video. Take the time to look at your content. Review your pages and figure out what are your top performing pages and what's missing. What kind of information do you need to add that maybe this current website doesn't have? Or the opposite, do you have so much information that you need to scale it back or think about creative ways to present it? Make a good list of keywords and look at your website. Is it still about the words that it was two years ago? Are there new words that should be added? Are there phrases that you really need to take out because it's no longer relevant for your business? Collect your brochures and your other marketing collateral and get everything that you have sort of in one place so that as you start working on this, you have all the pieces to refer to. And decide who's going to write that content. The words don't magically appear on the page. Someone has to have that job. And then dream big. You may ultimately have to scale back your ideas, but in this early phase, go out on the internet and look at websites. Search for other people that do what you do in other markets. Look for things that they're including on their website to give you ideas. There may be a lot of people that have very similar pages, but there may be some things that look completely different. Look at those websites and see what you think. I'm going to show you five different executive coaches. They each have a very different style and a very different approach. Justin is young and he's got kind of a even though he's dressed in a suit, these little paint swatches give the site a little bit more of an informal feel. Contrast that with Brendan Crowley. He's definitely got more years. He's got a tagline that's very different, where Justin tells you who he is and what he does. Brendan has decided to use this language to define what he does for you. Personally, I like customer focused copy and so this really pulls me in a little bit. And he also has a very specific agenda. Come to my website and join my email list. Hazel Walker is a professional speaker and her home page is 
a lot more informal. It pulls you in. There's more information, but there are two very specific calls to action. And as a published author, she's making a not so subtle reference to the fact that she has written this book. So all about him, all about the customer, about her expertise and a little more detail. Here are two other approaches that are really kind of different. In this instance, on the first three, the coach decided that they needed to be on their homepage. There was a picture of the coach. For both of these consultants, the emphasis is really more on the customer. Here's pictures of what a work environment might look like where Elizabeth would do her work. And here, Henry's consulting is really about helping nonprofits and nonprofits that are focused on children. So, start the conversation. It's very approachable. This top of the page is so important. Make a running list of different taglines and different calls to action as you try to decide what is it you want someone to do when they come to your website. These two are really different approaches. This is pretty, pretty high tech, pretty streamlined. It's not warm and fuzzy. This is not a life coach. This is definitely a company that is focused on kind of young, hip, millennial. It just has that feel. And this one, well, I'm not sure what this is. Um, helping people navigate the complexities of human weirdness. I think he's nailed it. I thought this website was weird. But if it works for him, I can't say that's a bad thing. But I do like, as I was looking at this, I liked both of these. This one for the very stark presentation, it's very no nonsense. Boom, this is what we do. Get started. And here, I really liked the collage. I didn't necessarily appreciate his choice of images, but I got some good ideas for things that we might do on a website, either for us or for a client. As you're browsing, go beyond your industry. Go to other websites that your customers might be looking at. If you're a hair salon and you're targeting high, um, high-end women customers, then take a look at high-end dress shops and accessory stores and jewelry stores for ideas and information. Don't just say, I'm a coach, I'm only going to look at coach websites. Collect URLs. You can do this in a Microsoft Word document or Evernote or however you take notes. Just keep cutting and pasting the web addresses to the websites that you like and think are cool. Make a list of all of the features that you think, man, I'd love that on my website. Pay attention to the style. How do they use video and, and podcasts? And how do they invite people to take that next step? Again, you may not do all of these things on your website, but if you don't dream big, if you don't get lots of examples, you're going to limit your design on the back end. So let's talk about you. Who's your ideal customer? Wait, I think you're probably wondering if the slides are out of order. Because didn't she say, let's talk about me? Well, yeah, I did. But here's the mistake that so many business owners make. They fall into this trap of thinking that their website is about them. And so that homepage copy is all about us, us, me, 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 aren't we wonderful, chest pound, chest pound, chest pound. Customers don't care. What they want to know is can you help me? Have I come to the right place? Have I found someone who can answer my questions, take away my pain? And the only way that you can create that experience is to define your target customers. Who are they? Think about demographics and psychographics. 
build a buyer persona. And I'm going to give you some examples in just a moment of what a good buyer persona is. And think about what are their issues and what makes you uniquely qualified. And this is where you can do a little bit of the we're great, we're great, we're great. Because if you tell me when I come to your website that I understand, you understand my problem, you have a solution, you earn the right to tell me about you. So what do you know? If you're in the consumer facing business, age, gender, income, lifestyle, what do they do on Saturday afternoon and where do they live? If you're selling primarily to other businesses, then think about size of company, business sectors, age of business, are they startups, are they established, where are they located, and what is their objective? Are they a high growth company, are they a stable organization, are they really in their twilight years trying to milk the business for all it's worth? When you know these things, it's easier to start creating marketing messages on your website to talk to these customers and to talk to them as individuals. To do that, you want to create a buyer persona that is built on their pain points and how you help. This is an example of a buyer persona. This is for a particular, these are a shoe company. And here you have a customer. They've given her a name. They've told you a little bit about her, her age, where she lives, how much money she makes. They've told you a little bit about what motivates her, what her goals are, and what her frustrations are. What was cool is when they built this persona, they kind of rolled up a lot of different customers, but they added to this page three different quotes from three real customers to make Brandy feel real. It's a lot easier when I'm writing web copy to do that if I have a picture in my head as to who Brandy is. Here's another example. This is Robert. And what I really like about this approach to the persona, they've defined his pain points, they've defined his goals, they've told you a little bit about his hobbies and some of his favorite social media apps. When you know this, now you've got a broader picture of what he might be interested in and how you might market to him. Clark, this was a really cool presentation. Again, you've got some goals and frustrations. Here they're talking about some of the brands that he likes. This was really important to us when we were doing a lot of work for a high-end optometrist and retail eyeglassware store. We knew that the people that he was selling to were likely to buy brands like Versace and Dolce Gabbana, Tom Ford and Gucci. And so knowing that those were the other brands this customer was interested in, we used some of those styling elements to guide the styling of the logo and the website. And this is Fred. You don't have to give the person a first and last name, but you have to make it real. You have to talk a little bit about learning and job role. In this instance, this buyer persona, Fred, is actually for a B2B transaction. In this instance, what the company did was they thought about we're selling to manufacturing companies and the people that we are calling on, what jobs are they likely to have? Who's going to make the buying decision? What are they responsible for? How do they get evaluated? Because if you understand these things, now you can begin to present your solution based on how it fits in with the things they care about. And so really, whether you've got a B2B or a B2C company, thinking about your customers as human beings and not just numbers makes it much easier to write real, relevant, compelling content. 
The next thing you need to think about, long before you build the website, is the first action. What is it you want someone to do when they come to your website? Small step or a giant leap? Do you want them to learn more, watch a video, schedule a demo, make a reservation? This is going to depend on your business model. For round peg, we've tried having a let's chat button here. It's too presumptuous. It's too much, too fast. People come to our website. They want to learn a little bit about us. They want to know where they're supposed to go first. And so we tell them your first step. This is where you go. Click here. Dennis and parking, they want people to buy parking. And so there's a giant button that says find and reserve parking. For Air One, schedule an appointment. So as you're thinking about your website, what is that first call to action? For Tish Flooring, it is about the making the appointment. We bring samples to you, schedule a free consultation. Yeah, you can look around, you can do other things, but this is really what we want you to do. Randall Beans, we, we know that people come to the website looking to learn more about the product. And usually it's how to use the product. And so that's why Browse Our Recipes is right here under the best beans. Once you figure out who your customer is and you figure out what you want them to do, another important question to answer is really, who are you? What is your brand personality? What words and phrases do you want customers to use to describe you? Adventurous, altruistic, authentic, authoritative, bold, brave, traditional, or warm. There are any number of adjectives. You can't be all of them. You can't be calm and clever, reliable, savvy, and rebellious. And so pick a really long list of phrases. Think about every word that you might use to describe the people that you know. And then step back and look at the entire list and circle five or ten. And those are the words that describe you. They may be what people think of you now. They may be what, they, what you want them to think about. If you tell me that you want your brand to be reliable, authoritative, dependable, I'm going to use pretty traditional colors, and I'm going to use a very traditional layout on the website. If you tell me you want to be rebellious and quirky, I'm going to do some more dynamic content on the page. I may have things move and shift a little bit because that's going to play into that personality you're trying to project. Think also about visual appeal. What colors appeal to you? What colors do you want to avoid? You already have brand colors, but beyond that, are there other colors? For example, at Round Peg, we are blue and teal. We have a nice orange that I use for accents and calls, calls, uh, calls to action. One of my designers really liked a half tone of the blue that came out kind of a baby blue. And she wanted to add that to our brand palette. And I got to tell you, I hated that color. Every time I saw it, I thought, oh, no, that is not round peg. And so we don't use that color because it just doesn't fit. The other thing you want to think about are symbols and icons and graphics. Some industries have certain images that are associated with the industry. And you may want to think about including those. And there are also images that you don't want associated with your brand. When we were working and designing a logo for a business coach, she said, you know, a lot of people in my industry use 
the phrase pinnacle and summit, and there's always these images of mountains and climbing mountains, and she's like, I totally do not want to look like any of those companies. And so we clearly avoided any references to those types of images. Brand associations. This is a little more out there, but it's a really fun exercise. We did this when I was working for a financial services company, and we, unlike a lot of our competitors, we did not want to target high net worth individuals. We really wanted to target middle America. And so we decided we were a daisy, not a rose. A daisy is still as complex and interesting as a rose, but it's much more approachable. It's friendlier, and there are no thorns. We were a golden retriever, not a French poodle. We, just the whole happy, relaxed face versus the sort of stern glower that you get from a poodle. There was none of that high strung, a little bit messy, kind of in your face, much more relaxed. Think about your own brand. Think about what kind of car you are, what kind of restaurant. When I worked for Carrier Corporation, we discovered that the Carrier brand was a Cadillac and the Bryant brand was a minivan or a station wagon. It was a family automobile. It was much more of a family friendly brand. So look at your words and look at the pictures and keep these around. It will help inspire you. And while we're talking about inspiration, this is another one of those kind of fun, creative activities to do with maybe your team. Start with a phrase, start with a few of those words that you think define you. We did this for a client, warm and welcoming, but crisp and modern. And we searched on Google and on Pinterest for each of those words. And we looked for images. And one of the first ones we found that we thought really worked was this one. It's a warm, welcoming room, but it still had a nice, clean feel. And what we did is actually on Pinterest, we began to collect lots of images. You can do it tearing pages out of magazines and putting them up on your bulletin board. Um, the thing I liked about doing a mood board on Pinterest was I could have lots of people pinning to the same board, sharing their photographs and ideas to build out this picture. For this customer, we also had phrases like working class and retro. And so some of the other images that ended up on the page were these. And we gave this collection of random pictures, and that's all they were, to the web team. But it gave them some inspiration. There was the denim blue that came through. There were the kind of retro fonts that came through in the styling. And what we saw was a final product that really reflected the mood. You see the blue denim, you see the traditional font, you see some of the warm colors in that video, and all the pieces really come together nicely. All of this is great, but beyond just what it looks like and what it feels like, you need to be thinking about what you want your website to do. You need to think about the structure. What comes first? What do customers want to know? And what do you want them to see? This is Union 50, and they are a fabulous restaurant here in Indianapolis. When you land on their homepage, they want you to make reservations. They know that people may also want locations and gift cards, but they know most people are coming for the reservations, and at the end of the day, that's what they want. You also want to think beyond just the home page. You want to think about whether or not you're going to have blogs and news features and events. And you need to make a list of all of these features because each of these are going to require certain steps in the design process. Knowing somebody wants a big push for their newsletter or downloadable content, I'm going to make design decisions early in the process. 
Knowing somebody wants people to be able to browse images, look at their video gallery, collect their favorites. Again, I'm going to choose different options. If there's going to be a shopping cart, I need to know that before I start building. Calendars, registration forms, member-only pages. If you're going to have password-protected content, do not wait until week seven in the development to tell your web team that you need to have multiple levels of access. And if you're going to have contact forms, if people are going to be able to apply for jobs online, make an appointment, maybe upload specifications, all of these things you need to outline up front. And also think about the extras and talk to whoever is going to manage your website about these things. Malware and spam protection. WordPress sites and all websites are significantly more resistant to hacking than they used to be, but only if you install good spam and malware protection. Regular backup service. You need to have a plan to update, not update, but to back up your website regularly, even if you are not changing it very much. I had a client whose web host had not backed up her website in three years. And he let her domain name expire. And when he rebuilt the site, he had to restore the three-year-old version. That is unacceptable. You also want to have a plan for updating any software that's running as part of your website. You want to make sure that you build the site and include Google tracking code so you can learn what's going on your website and make improvements based on what you're learning. And you want whoever is building your website to create a site structure that is appropriate for search engines and build in those foundational SEO elements that you can build on over time. And then you're going to build the website and then you're going to launch it. And you want to have a launch plan. As your web team is working on building the site, think about how you're going to celebrate. Send a newsletter. What are you going to share on social media? And how are you going to measure performance 30, 60, and 90 days in to make sure that your website is living up to all the expectations that you had in mind in the beginning? The work isn't done on launch day. The work is just beginning. And I know that this is a hard thing to hear after you've spent five, ten, fifteen thousand dollars on a website. But it's the truth. You have to think about how people are going to find your website and how you're going to promote it. And you need to be aware of the fact that the life cycle on a website today is 18 months to two years. Now you can prolong your life with frequent updates, little refreshes and little changes, but Every two years, you need to be thinking about serious overhauling. The good news is with a structure like WordPress, we've updated our website in the last 15 years. We've updated it numerous times, but we've never had to rebuild the content. We just change the theme, make some new pages, make some minor adjustments, but the core website is still the same. And you need to think about who's going to be responsible for updating your website. Search engines want new, fresh information, and you have to have a plan to give it to them. This is what the Round Peg website looked like in 2002. And it was fine. It was cute, and it did what it needed to do. And we kept it around until 2008 when we went to our first WordPress site. So we had our first website for six or seven years. This might have even been early 2009. And then there was the site in 2011, 2012, 2000, 
14, 2015, and now today. One of the things that you notice as you look at the newer versions, you'll see that the site hasn't changed as much. These two, once we found this format really worked for us, we got a bolder headline, clearer call to action. We introduced our avatar, which is part of our branding. And again, we had some more specific calls to action. We made some changes in the structure here. Having a WordPress structure has allowed us to make those small updates over time that continues to keep the site fresh and interesting. But I know a year from now we're going to have to blow it up and start over. So as you're thinking about your web design, be thinking about this one and the next. If you have questions, please reach out to me. I'd love to talk about your website.